In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So what was with that rather strange exchange between Mary Magdalene and the risen Jesus? Very strange when you think about it. Mary Magdalene had been with Jesus from almost the beginning. We're told that Jesus cast out seven demons from her and that she had accompanied the group from there on and had uh, apparently being a person of means had helped fund all of Jesus's ministry. Mary Magdalene probably knew Jesus as well as anybody and yet he stood in front of her and she didn't recognize him. Not until he said her name did she recognize him. Then when he did something really typical of him she realized who it was. But you would think, wow, I mean, all this time and she can't recognize him. But Mary Magdalene was not alone in that way. There are a number of post-resurrection stories in the Gospels and they share that in common, that people don't recognize Jesus immediately. Now, if, you were, if we were all to come back tonight, which we're not, but if we were, the evening service has a, another story of two disciples who were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, probably a couple, a husband and wife, and Jesus joined them and walked along with them. And these, again, were people who had been with Jesus a lot. They didn't recognize him. And he even as he was walking with them and he was explaining to them all the scriptures that were predicting that he would, in fact, be, re- be risen, raised from the dead, they didn't recognize him. It wasn't until they got to their home and they invited him in to dinner, and at the dinner he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them, something he'd done with them many, many times, and then they recognized him. And then he disappeared. We don't often see people disappear in front of our eyes, but he did. And presumably minutes later, he appeared in the room, upper room, where all the other, the 11 disciples were essentially hiding, a room that was locked with the windows closed for fear, and suddenly Jesus was there, without opening the door. And it took them a couple of tries before they realized who he was when he commissioned them to be apostles. We could go on and on, but one of the distinctions we see about the risen Christ is he doesn't look exactly like he did before his crucifixion and resurrection. There's something completely different about him. And yet, it's the same Jesus. Because once he does something familiar, they recognize it in him. And yet, he looks different. How do we explain this? Well, in short, there's no way to explain it. It's kind of hard on us. We are children of the Enlightenment of the 18th century. We, know, we think rationally and we think in very literal terms and we think scientifically. And there's no way to explain what happened because it had never happened before. It's happened only that once with a promise, though, that it will happen again. St. Paul writes in letter to the Colossians that in Christ there is a new creation. Behold, everything has been made new. The resurrected Jesus was and is a new creation, something never seen before. The first ever risen body. St. Paul talks about it several places in several different ways also. He talks about in the epistle we heard today, if, you, if we'd kept reading, we would have heard him talk about, well, what about the risen body? And the term he uses is, is physical body versus spiritual body. He says if, there's been a, if there is a physical body, then there's also a spiritual body. And he compares the physical body to a seed. 
a little kernel, nothing like what will be realized or is realized with the spiritual body, with the resurrection. Something brand new, unexplainable, and yet it is. It's been a problem since the beginning. And we should note that in all of the the, uh, resurrection stories of Jesus, there is one thing that everybody agreed on. That one thing was that the tomb was empty. Even the authorities who had Jesus crucified agreed the tomb was empty. And ever since that, then, there have been lots of attempts to explain it. The first one is in the Gospels, where they said, oh, somebody came and stole the body. But throughout history, we've had a terrific time trying to explain, well, what exactly happened on on Easter morning? There's no way. Although we've tried. The the rationalists of the 19th century uh, came up with some great uh, descriptions of, the well, Jesus was really in a coma. They just didn't recognize it. They put him in the tomb, and somehow he got better, and he woke up, and he walked out. Um, But that's not at all what the gospel says, and that's not what we believe. We believe as God recreated him as himself, but now different. And you've got to admit, the risen Jesus did things that you and I don't do. None of us has ever gone through a closed door. I don't think. He's different, and yet he's the same Jesus. And his promise is, God's promise, is this is now our destiny. Our destiny through baptism. That we become heirs of this same eternal life that we see in Christ Jesus. Now without the resurrection, if we, if we don't trust that this in fact is what God has done, most everything else we do doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Jesus no longer then is the incarnate word of God. He's no longer our Lord and Savior. He's just an interesting person, a very interesting person who said some very interesting things. And we see at times through history, there are people for whom that's where the conclusion they've come to because that's what they can understand. And so Jesus becomes a great moral exemplar or an interesting figure in history. But if we trust God, that God did raise Jesus from the dead, and that he is alive now and is our Lord and Savior, then that makes a difference in our lives. It puts a claim on us if that's the way we now choose to live our lives, if we are going to respond in faith. Now that's not to say that we live without doubt. Faith and doubt are not opposites, but they actually go together. The opposite of faith is not doubt. It's it's either no faith or apathy. But it's normal for us to have doubts especially when it comes to the resurrection, which we cannot explain. But to live into the news, the good news of the resurrection, means that we are going to live into that truth, align our lives and our practices with that truth. And all of that is tied up in our baptismal vows, which we are going to renew in just a minute. In our baptismal vows, the first part of the baptismal vows are the Apostles' Creed, where we recite the salvation history of God, God who created us, the God who saved and redeemed us through Jesus Christ, the God who empowers us and quickens us for ministry through the presence of the Holy Spirit. That, that's the Apostles' Creed. But then following that in our baptismal vows are five questions which we answer our will with God's help. And those five questions are the essence of what it means to live in the light of the resurrection. 
Will we come together as, a, as the body of Christ, as the church, to worship together and learn together and support each other? Will we continue to resist sin? Note, being baptized does not mean that sin leaves our lives, but being baptized means that we have power over sin now. Will we continue to resist sin and repent and return to the Lord every time we do? Will we share the good news of God in Christ? Will we seek and serve Christ in all persons? Will we love our neighbors as ourselves? Will we struggle and strive for justice and peace, respecting the dignity of every human being? That, that's how our lives then are changed. It's not necessarily going to always be an easy life because there's not a guarantee in there of either safety or money or any of the other things we may value. What's in there is much more valuable, but it's not that. I've had an ongoing uh, argument with my sister. I love my sister, but I've had this ongoing argument. She is absolutely terrified of refugees. Uh, she's afraid that a refugee, if we let them into the country, that some that a terrorist would se- would sneak in and do terrible things. And she said, "Lock them out. Right? Don't let any in." And I've argued with her. I said, "You know, the gospel is clear that we have an absolute responsibility to minister to and care for and love and accept refugees. It's very clear. It's both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can't not do that." And she says, but what about safety? And I said, I've had to say, Jesus never promised us safety. Instead, what he did say is, if any person would become my disciple, let him or her take up his or her cross and follow me. Now, that may sound something frightening, but the reality is that for when you live in the light of the resurrection, the cross is a gift and not a threat that we can accept the risks of, of following Jesus. We can accept the risk of, all the th- of doing the ministry which is about transforming this world into the kingdom of God, into the vision of what God wants it to be. We can accept that because we know that God will never abandon us, even in death, and that death will never be the final word for us. The final word will always be resurrection. The final word will always be eternal life in Christ with God. And so we are able to live that life and respond in faith and hope and love and not succumb to fear and to sin again. That's the good news of the resurrection. That's what believing in the resurrection does. It gives us the power and the faith to live a transformed life. Amen.